Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is David Alsobrook. I'll just read a little bio of David here. David was born again in 1969, and I'm going to want to ask you what that means, at age 15. Two years later, he began traveling full-time at the age of 17 in full-time ministry across the U.S. and abroad, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. His ministry has taken him to more than 2,000 congregations of many different denominations and non-denominations. He has preached in 48 states and all over the lower provinces of Canada. In his 20s, he began writing books, which have found their way into no fewer than 50 nations and have been translated into many languages. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> David has uh, written, co-written, or ghost-written about four dozen titles. He is not a high school graduate, neither was I, by the way, although I got a GED, uh, and only briefly attended college as a non-degree student. His ordination is Orthodox Anglican, uh, but his ministry is transdenominational in scope. Despite his lack of formal education, he has taught the Word of God in numerous Bible schools and Bible colleges. Thousands of people have received life-changing experiences with God through his ministry, including numerous miracles of all kinds. He has, been, he has been miraculously healed of Epstein-Barr virus, a heart problem, and failing eyesight, although he does have a bit of a cold at the moment, right, David? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All confirmed by later medical tests. The greatest miracle he has ever received since his new birth, however, was a miracle of sudden radical transformation in yes. 2008. This miracle brought fullness of life, freedom from mental anxieties of all sorts, and deep, profound peace. And uh, probably that transformation that happened in 2008 is the reason I'm interviewing you today. Because if yes. it hadn't happened, you probably wouldn't have been interested in Buddha at the gas pump. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, and I probably wouldn't have found, quite found an angle which oh, yeah. kind of justified my, my interviewing you. Uh, so we want to hear your whole story and, you know, what led up to that transformation and, and the, you know, the nature of the transformation itself and what impact it's had on your life ever since and all sorts of things like that. Um, and there are also some anomalies, I, I would have to say. I mean, yes. you know, I have just, I, I don't think that having a spiritual awakening um, necessarily means you know, if you took a thousand people who had had the kind of spiritual awakening you've had, they might have all sorts of different uh, religious and political yes. and moral opinions, yes, which which might true. actually differ from one another. And oh, and, yes. and you have some, uh, from what I see on your website and and have seen on some of your videos, you have some rather typical conservative moral opinions, mm. uh, which kind of are you know consistent with conservative Christianity. Yes, um, but at the same time. That, and I'm cool with that. Um, at the same time, you have, uh, you know, had this very profound awakening, which which uh, enriches in yeah. every every moment of your life. So it is it is an anal anomaly. Anal anomaly. Uh, anomaly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll get into that. Um, but uh, why don't we start by just having people get to know you a little bit better. Okay. Um, you know, give us a bit more of your background, whatever you consider is relevant, and we have plenty of time to go into the details of it. And uh, I'm sure you'll want to go into quite some detail about this uh, so-called transformation experience yes. that happened in, in 2008. Well, uh, let me see. I, I was raised in a minister's home, Christian home, and uh, believed the Bible was the Word of God, just raised up in that. And... Um, read and studied the Bible uh, in church, Sunday school, all of that. And uh, But when I was 15, I committed my life to Christ, as we say in Christian terminology, and received the new birth or the born-again experience that Jesus talked about in uh, John's Gospel. And uh, during that time, um, I became an avid Bible reader, um, student. Hang on just a second, if you don't mind. Um, I don't actually know what the born again experience is, and yes. when I've heard about that experience, I have either 
thought that perhaps it had to do with just some emotional frenzy that you see people getting whipped into in, in, <laughs> in some yeah. kind of Christian uh, gatherings, yeah. or mm -hmm. perhaps actually some sort of non-dual <laughs> awakening of the kind that you had uh, in 2008. But you distinguish that born-again experience oh, yes. from your, the, So yeah. what is, yes. and, and do all Christians sort of agree, if you say, say born-again, are they really all talking the same language, or could that refer to a whole lot of different things? No, it's basically referring to the same thing when you hear Christians refer to being born again or born from above, born anew. Uh, it's the receiving of divine life into your spirit. Traditional Christians uh, teach and believe that uh, man's spirit is deadened to God because of sin, born in original depravity, and then also uh, disobedience to the revealed word of God in the scriptures and that an individual must be born again to receive this life from above, this spiritual quickening inside. But it's, it is not uh, the transformation experience. Uh, there was nearly 40 years between my born again experience, which was the genuine, what Christians believe and teach, and then receiving this soul transformation. Uh, born again happens in the deepest part, the spirit in the in Christian view the holy spirit births your spirit and then transformation happens in the soul realm so there's a distinguishing between spirit and soul okay would it be germane right now to try to parse that out what the difference is between spirit and soul or are we getting too picky right now to do we're probably getting a little too picky for our audience right okay now. well let's let's, <laughs> let, let's get into that later on okay okay and um but now you know there are hindus buddhists Yes. Muslims, agnostics, who yeah. have profound awakenings and, and yes. experiences. Yeah. I, Are I, those uh, born-again experiences and they just don't use that terminology? Or would, would you insist that that's a completely different animal and, and, and only Christians, you know, explicitly Christian people, have quote-unquote born-again experiences? Well, uh, Rick, as I've been looking at everything the last few years, I... I've come to see that m many people experience probably the same thing when all use different terms. Okay. Yes. Because on your website, it still says something about in your youth how you, you know, uh, indulged in false religions before committing your life to Jesus Christ, and yes. that, that false religions is a bit of a red flag. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure it is. Uh, yeah. But uh, I don't know. Uh, if I would say it just that way now. Okay. You need to update I, your website. I'm, I'm evolving. Yeah. <laughs> it's a process. I mean, whenever somebody tries to proselytize me, you know, I say, hey, study astronomy. You know, I mean, yeah. the Kepler telescope now tells us that there are probably 40 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone. Wow. And then there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the known universe. Yes. And for all we know, yes. there might be countless universes. Uh, yes, it uh, might be continuing. It might be yeah. new universes constantly being made. So here we are on this, this weensy beansy speck of dust. <laughs> yes. And yes. and who are we to say that we've got the total monopoly on, on uh, truth oh, yeah. or spirituality or <laughs> anything else? No. Yeah. In fact, I've enjoyed so much reading, uh, you know, from uh, uh, different ones like Hafiz lately. He's yeah. my new heartthrob. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Who's a Sufi. Uh, yes, I love that Sufi and, and, and Rumi. Rumi you know, yeah. They speak so much to my heart and, and so similar. And, and in Judaism, we see so many things in classical Judaism that a vibrant spiritual life. And, yeah. Uh, Ramana Maharshi. There you go. Uh, I, 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 yeah, the awakening the self. Abide is the self, his mm -hmm. teaching there. I love it. Ha. I resonate with these guys. Well, I hope you don't put yourself out of business by saying this. <laughs> I mean, you well, must. I don't know why. I, you know, i uh, I'm an anomaly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I honor you for you know. I mean, it takes a certain yes. amount of courage, really, because I mean, you, yeah. your, your profession is to be a Christian teacher, and yeah. you must have a certain congregation or a certain listenership or or, or whatever who yes. who resonates with what you have to say. And yeah, may, many congregations, many churches. I've never been a, a localized minister. I've always traveled and spoken in churches. Yeah. yeah. And, mm -hmm. but, you know, what you're saying now is, uh, gee, all, all these different expressions of, you know. Have validity. Yeah. yeah. And that's not, that's not traditional Christian teaching, at least, no, no, it, at least it the is. way it has come down. I mean, maybe some of the early right. Gnostics felt that way or something, but 
So right, they, I guess yeah. I could be labeled a Gnostic now. I was mm. reading a book on Gnosticism the other day. I, I ordered this book and thought, hey, that sounds like me, but I'm not so concerned about about that. There doesn't seem to be a me all that much anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Just sort of something I read and resonate with or don't resonate with. And it can be written by a Christian or a Muslim and think, ooh, that's, ooh, I, it's left field. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> beautiful. Uh, so let's get back to your story. That, that kind of, I think, will enable most of my listeners to breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> 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 you know, because you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's, there's just, they're fundamentalists in every religion. And, yes. and I think it's, it has a lot more to do with human mentality than it has yes, to do with, it has I, to do with truth. I'm definitely not a fundamentalist and haven't been for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ram Das is one of my favorite teachers now. Mm. Yeah. Experiments in truth. I love his... Uh, mm. Great. Yeah. And there's a certain kind of chest beating, my way is the best way mentality that, yeah. that, that, that shows <laughs> yeah. up. But I, personally, I think it, it's symptomatic of a, a kind of an insecurity. You know, there, uh, Yeah, it's a deep unhealed pain inside. There. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have to be right. It's, it's all ego. Yeah. I have to be right. My way is right. And we need people to agree with us, to uh, affirm in our own heart that, yes, I am on the right path. And, of course, after transformation happens, all of that just dissolves. In 2008, an instantaneous miracle, just everything in me of, of that way just, just crumbled and dissolved. Yeah. And it's, it's gone. Shall we get into that now, or do you want to? I, I've kind of thrown you off the course of your unfoldment of your story, but we can go back to uh, if you feel like there are more. Uh, it's whatever, whatever you would like to, to talk about. Oh, uh, we'll just flow along. But uh, you know, you were starting to tell your life, and you're young, and you're traveling, and you're teaching, and all yes, that stuff. And I, but I, still had much inner misery. Yeah. And, unless I was functioning in my gifting, you know, preaching and teaching in front of people, then laying hands on people, praying for people. And uh, seeing miracles, which I could not deny, they they truly happen. Miracles are real. I not only have experienced them, I have seen them thousands of times. Isn't it kind of interesting that when you put yourself in the role of a teacher, uh, a switch goes on, and mm -hmm. you actually become something greater than what you ordinarily are? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. When the inner inner flow begins, of course, it isn't it isn't the little self here. It is you know the self <laughs> yeah the the flowing of the life the divine the divine mind and you're serving as a sort of instrument and and as an mm -hmm. instrument yes. you're, something much greater is happening than it ordinarily happens when you're just david also brook you know oh, ma yes. making yeah. breakfast or, or, or watching you watching you uh, on your programs which i've so loved uh, sometimes i see that happen in you there's it, there's rick and then suddenly there's that voice that i know <laughs> It does I hear happen. That voice. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. used to teach meditation for many years also, and that would happen. Yes. You'd, you'd get up in front of a few hundred people and start talking, and boy, you know, something would wake up in you, in you that just wasn't ordinary. Yes, <laughs> yes, I love I love it when that happens. Yeah, it's it's so, and and you can recognize it in in anyone, uh, in, in any realm of functioning when that happens. Yeah. Yeah, I think it. I mean, just. To diverge and just take this conversation wherever it may go. It even happens in in uh, you know rock musicians yes. and stuff. You yes. know, they, yes. Mick Jagger gets up on the stage in front of ten thousand people, <laughs> and there's a certain something that you know begins yeah. to shine through him that I'm sure he doesn't have every moment of his life. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, back to the story. Okay. So. Uh, well, uh, even though I was uh, very devout. Christian, uh, studious uh, in the scriptures, uh, the Old and New Testament scriptures, that Christian Bible, uh, and knew them so well, not only English, but Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, quite you, a bit. You learned those languages? Uh, yeah, I have studied them. Wow. I'm not, to speak them, I'm not conversant, but to re read it, see it, and understand what it's saying or pointing to cool. fa fairly well over the years. Yeah, very, very studious. <laughs> Uh, but it didn't, it didn't, it, there was only temporary relief of pain. Uh, I was, I was born with pain, it seemed like. And, uh, and it would be temporarily assuaged or relieved uh, during times of prayer, uh, becoming still, uh, praying in the Holy Spirit, Christian experience of praying in the Holy Spirit. 
which I noticed that Francis Bennett on your program a few months ago, he referred to that also. And the uh, edif edification I would sense in my spirit would sort of take over, rise above, and, and submerge the pain that I felt, the, the, the struggle, the misery, the inner misery, the conflict. But it would only be temporary in any case. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be permanent. It wouldn't be a permanent relief. And uh, I went through a, uh, in 2005, I uh, went through a devastating life experience. And I began to realize I don't really know anything. All of these years, for what? Uh, only temporary relief of pain. And I had seen real miracles that I could not doubt. I had received real miracles in my body that, that medicine had, doctors had verified. I, I knew there was reality to my faith, to my spiritual life, but it was so fragmentary. It was so much a, a smaller part of, of who I was. In fact, I didn't even know who I was. For a long time, I was so wrapped up in my functioning that my role identity as a preacher, teacher, you know, I am a preacher. So if I am a human who preaches, I, I am a preacher. I, I was so caught up in that, that uh, when I wasn't doing those things, my sense of value, my significance would also be diminished. And so in 2005, I, I began uh, uh, truly doing what Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. These other things I was looking for. So I began to, to seek first the kingdom of God and to study what does the kingdom of God mean. Uh, here's another place where I may quote heretic. Because most Christians believe the kingdom of God is yet future. That it's going to come visibly. When Jesus said the kingdom of God does not come with signs to be perceived. Lo, here it is. Or lo, there it is. He said, for lo, or look, the kingdom of God is within you. And that had never become real to me. But for the next three years, I just put everything aside and made it, knowing God my preeminent purpose in life, seeking God as I understood him, uh, applying the teachings of Jesus, which to me had been excluded from most Christian lives and it's amazing, Rick, uh, speaking as a Christian, how far away from the teachings of Christ the church is today, how far we've gone. And historically also, from what I know of church history, that the, the atrocities committed in the name of Christ, the, the Crusades and everything else. Oh, yeah, the Spanish Inquisition and oh, all yes. sorts of terrible things. Um, um, well, you know, I mean, when administrative mentalities get a hold of spiritual teachings. Yeah. <laughs> right. when, when, when the ego and the mind and there gets a form established of a church that we have to propagate and, and keep going, gets going along, then uh, all kinds of terrible uh, atrocities have been committed in yeah. the name of Christ. He's been blamed for so much. Sure. And, um, you know, Christianity is not exclusively guilty of this. I mean, all look at what happens with Islam. I mean... Uh, I'm sure there's some, well, Rumi that you were just mentioning was a Sufi, right. which is a branch of Islam, and, uh, yes. and, and Hafiz, very spiritual guys, yes. but look at some of the crazy stuff that's, that's right. done, done we, in the name. Most of his poems are, are lost to us today yeah. because of Muslim clerics banning his writings, and mm -hmm. book burnings, and so on. And a great deal of Christian teaching, I believe, is either lost or, oh, you know, same, the, the whole... Same thing. Exact same thing, yes. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I was reading something or other about the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they were probably yes. hidden away on purpose because <laughs> the Gnostics were being persecuted yes. by, the, by the, the, the sort of more fundamentalist types and, and mm -hmm. wanted to sort of preserve those teachings and they're finally found in 1946 or something and yes. opened up a whole new chapter. Um, but you were just saying that, okay, you'd been a, a Christian for decades and, you know, yes. professional one, so to speak, you know, <laughs> traveling around and teaching yes, and preaching. That's right. but, then, but then you entered this phase where for several years, uh, how do you, you took a fresh approach. And, and it's not completely clear to me the distinction between what you had been doing and then what you began to do during those several years. <sighs> I, I know it's so hard to find words. <laughs> Uh, so far, hard to find words. Uh, let me just say in the application of Christianity uh, and in the practice of Christianity, 
we tend to completely get away from the Sermon on the Mount, which is the greatest teaching that Jesus ever gave, his teaching on turning the other cheek, his teaching on seeking the lower place. Uh, all of these things uh, we, we have so strayed from in modern Christianity today. And Is that the one and, you, where he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, yes, and all those yes, beautiful things? Yes, okay. yes. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, it's th three chapters, Matthew's Gospel, mm -hmm. chapters five, six, and seven. And, and, he, and he was so simple. Uh, Christians have made everything so complicated, but Christ made it so simple, mm. so sweet. What do you think about the new Pope? Oh, I like uh, Francis, and uh, he's so genuine, he, uh, and the, hum the humility that I sense in the man. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. Everybody yeah. sees that, you know. Uh, it's just, I know. <laughs> it's a kind Beautiful. of a, it's a hopeful sign. I uh, hope uh, we... un unassuming, uh, e e egoless. Yeah. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful. Great guy. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then I guess what you're saying is you entered a phase where... I, you, I, I, you went, I left Christianity to go back to Christ. <laughs> right. Yeah. You stopped chewing on the, on the rind of the orange and began get, getting yeah, to the, the deep, inner juice. Deep, yes, deep, deep. <laughs> yes. And, and not only reading uh, you know, Matthew's Gospel, which is so clear there, but uh, the Gospel of Thomas which traditionally has been rejected by the church, That's which is one of the finds. It? It's called Gnostic. Right. But, but it was uh, the, the Gospel of Thomas and Gospel of Matthew were the two accepted Gospels the first 70 years of the church history. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is so clear in there, which, which Luke later quoted after Thomas had written it, because Thomas wrote his Gospel within 20 years mm -hmm. of the crucifixion. And then and this stuff was, got edited out at the Council of Nicaea or some such thing? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Church, yeah, we could go uh, back to the various councils. Uh, yeah. Men with very heavy minds that decided, yeah. oh, we, we, got it to, we can't go along with that. Because that doesn't help advance our, our purpose, our program right. in establishing the church. We've got to make people feel that the physical church on the earth is, is, is central to, to the message of Christ. Uh, whereas... Uh, you know, like, uh, well, I could just go way off here, but in the, in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said that uh, you can chop a piece of wood and lo, I am there. Mm -hmm. He was teaching that he, that he is everywhere. The Christ spirit is everywhere. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they put in this little proviso that everything in this book is true and you can't change anything. You know? that, that's right. <laughs> uh, oh, all of that. Yes. Yeah, and then a lot of people still buy and, into and that. And then there's so many contradictions even and, and mistranslations when you study like the Greek New Testament. You find so many mistranslations into our English versions, and and then there's a, a war within Christendom, with Christendom, which is dumb Christianity. <laughs> there is an ongoing feud, you know, which version is the right version? Mm -hmm. yeah, King James of 1611, which no one really has. The King James of 1611 has gone through like 30 revisions over the centuries, and so what people think is the original King James that they read isn't even the original King, King James. Yeah. But, but uh, yes, Christi Christendom, again, it's full of all these contradictions. And, yeah. Well, I just get back to astronomy. 40 billion <laughs> Earth-like planets, you know, and uh, and certainly, obviously, the universe can't be 6,000 6, years old. And, oh, no. uh, and, and as I would even go so far, well, I would definitely go so far as to say that there are many paths to God, and Jesus isn't the only way, at least not Jesus the man. If he is, then he's on a very busy tour to 40 billion planets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but the, the Christ. The Christ, within, the, the inner yes, essence, yes, yeah. Yes. That's yes. the only way. I am. Right. Way. Got it. Okay, so back to your story. Oh, anyhow, uh, from 2005 to 2008, I, I'd gotten involved in 12-step programs to help me recover from emotional hurts and abuse, and I found them very helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, practicing, uh, you know, all of the steps, you know, learning to do those steps and apply them to my life. And uh, <clears throat> one day, I had heard someone in a 12-step ga gathering share about just getting out alone. And so I'd begun doing that. It helped my mind from all of its busyness and, and uh, incessant work. And I, I would just go outside and I, there was a nature preserve, or there is one about five miles from where I live. I would go out and, and just sit, uh, you know, by the lake on a bench. And it was mostly devoid of human traffic. 
hiking during the day. There wasn't many people. And I would just enjoy nature and, and practice what Jesus said once again in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, to, to look at the fowl of the air, to look at the flower. And I began to sense such a resonance coming with it in me, a stillness in my mind when I would look at something in nature and say, ah, oh, yes, I could, I could sense the life underneath it, the life enveloping it. And one day while I was out in the nature preserve, I was walking and I was headed toward the, the little uh, lakeside uh, uh, bench that I was going to sit on, normally sit there. And about 100 feet in front of it as I was on this path, there was this large flat rock and, and it came to me very strong, sit on that rock. And, and I obeyed and just sat down and it was kind of uncomfortable. And as I kind of squiggled, my mind suddenly became still. And it was as though I then, although I was very alert, Rick, and very aware, it was like I wasn't even there. And it was just like uh, the me that I always thought I was, this David with all my problems and all my unmet needs and all of my failures in life and all of these uh, di different uh, uh, pain, unresolved conflict, and things from childhood, everything. It's like all of that just crumbled in front of me. It's like a, a, uh, like a statue of me just crumbling and, and blowing away. And I could see the brilliant light that it was in the grass around me, the leaves of the trees and um, the tr tree in front of me. It was like this beautiful light just filled it. And I, I, I knew that light was life, the very life of God. So you're not talking just about reflected sunlight, but you're talking about a sort of a, an yes, emanation it, or something from... And it, uh, it, was, it was brighter than the sunlight. Mm. Uh, it, it did not hurt the eyes. But it was very visible, and it was the perfect outline of each leaf. There was also an outline of light around it. The I've often tree, wondered so. if that's what the burning bush was all about. Have you ever thought of? Do you think? I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if that's what Moses saw or not. But I know that's what I saw. Yeah. And uh, and I lost all sense of time, all sense of me, all sense of everything. But there there was a, a deep reality that not only that. I, I was experiencing, it was much deeper. It was a reality that I was, that I always had been, that I am, that I always am. This deep reality. Oh, such reality, peace, life. And uh, when I finally got up, the sun had moved far in the afternoon sky. And when I went there, it was in the morning. <laughs> And I've never been the same mm. ever since that day. Yeah, yeah, because you you're referring to it in the past tense, but obviously it's not yeah. past tense, is it? Uh, no, no, very, very right here, right now. Mm -hmm. And so in the twelve step groups, I I was listening, and when I would share, I began to share this sort of thing, and uh, uh, a lady, that young lady, brought up to me after a, a meeting. She said, "I think you might enjoy this book," and it was called "The Power of Now." Eckhart Tolle. E Eckhart Tolle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took him and began to read and say, yes, <laughs> this, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was so glad to see that someone had elucidated and verbalized what I had experienced with him. Yes. Yeah. His experience was kind of like yours too, in a way, because he wasn't really expecting this or anything. Right. It just kind of dawned on him one day. Yeah, he had been in a lot of misery. Now, he hadn't been on the spiritual path or seeking. He was... Yeah. I believe he was 29 years old when his awakening tape took place. Mm -hmm. uh, and here I was, uh, you know, in my 50s and, and had already been through lots of failure, repeated failures, repeated <laughs> over and over. Just get to the place of despairing of life. Just when will it stop? I just want it to be over. <laughs> yeah. And leading up to this uh, transformation experience, you had actually, I mean, not only had you dedicated your life to spirituality in, yes, its, yes. in various forms over decades, but yes. you had also established a practice of hours of deep prayer every morning. Yes, hadn't you? that's true. Yes. Yeah. So, in a way, you, I mean, you were engaged in a meditative practice. Of, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. for 40, over 40 years. So. <laughs> uh, seriously, too. I mean, hours. Yes, seriously. Hours daily. a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, because some people, I don't know, since I'm a 
meditator myself, uh, you know, I, I have a little bit of a bone to pick with people who say that practice is irrelevant and isn't, yeah. isn't going to have any kind of an influence. Um, and I intensified all of that during uh, 2005 following. I mean, no, uh, no television, uh, j just every waking moment. I was cry I was so desperate for mm -hmm. God. And, and th then the answer, the way it happened, I never would have thought of that, ex could imagine that. Totally uh, unexpected, like, you know, how could you plan or think or something like that? Mm. Uh, wh what's the significance of a flat rock? And, you know, <laughs> what was, but it was just, a, I, I believe it was just choosing to obey that inner voice. Yeah. And, and let go of that ego, because the self, the voice of self, the ego was so... Uh, prevalent in my life and as it is in, in many people I know uh, in their spiritual life has taken over the role in that also but has disguised itself where they they can't see it hmm. mm -hmm. they don't yeah. know it's it, it's ego as Jesus said father forgive them they know not what they, they do, do. Yes. right so obviously you were an intense seeker really yeah yes and uh, which also yeah points, you know, kind of a, pertains to this, this anti-seeker bias that you see here in some spiritual circles. Um, yeah, I, you know, I've, but, I've, I've noticed that in yeah. different places too uh, <clears throat> since, but I, I, you know, whatever works for people, yeah. I certainly would encourage that. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't think just, uh, you know, uh, getting a bud, bud Light and sitting in front of the TV is going to <laughs> produce trauma. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened, yes, huh? Yes, yeah. yes, In fact, uh, there are a lot of saints and teachers who say that, you know, the most um, influential thing in terms of realizing God is the desire to do so. And yes. that, that whatever specifically you may do, it's the desire itself yes. which has the greatest effect. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, I heard someone say, I think it was Teresa of Avila, Who's also become a sweetheart to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love the Christian mystics uh, and John of the Cross and some of their writings. I believe she said, uh, God seeks to be sought. He longs to be longed for. Mm. He desires to be desired. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Marshi Mahesh Yogi once gave a lecture like that where he said that God is like an artist and uh, very few people appreciate the artist's work. Uh, and he's producing all these wonderful works, but hardly anyone yes. appreciates it. And, yes. and if some guy starts to really appreciate it, uh, the artist will kind of like, you know, perk up. He'll say, oh, there's someone who really appreciates it. And he'll come to the appreciator. Yes. You know, the appreciator yes. won't have to come to him. He'll, exactly. he'll come knock at the door and say, hey, I, I understand you really yes. <laughs> you yes. get it. <laughs> yeah, and it can be so simple as observing uh, God's presence in nature. Mm. You know, the, the creator's life is in what he created. Appreciating beauty that is all around us, everywhere, I believe, pleases him. Yes. Mm -hmm. But of course, we have to have the capacity to appreciate, you know, those, yes. those who have eyes to see, let them see. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And pearls before swine and all that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you know a lot of the Christian terminology that I noticed this miraculously somehow I mean I you know <laughs> my mother would drag me kicking and screaming to church on oh, Sundays okay. and it would okay. pretty much ruin my day but you know <laughs> after I you know mine too I hated church as a child <laughs> I always be out playing baseball or something yeah but you know after I kind of got into spirituality as a teenager then then I began yeah. to understand what it was talking about and eventually read the Bible cover to cover, and even, oh, oh, even, okay. even the Book of Mormon I read cover to cover, which yeah. was, <laughs> as Mark Twain said, chloroform in print, but I did it. <laughs> I, I did that for fun one time, too. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was entertaining, some of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so when you got up, that, up off that rock, well, is there anything more to say about the experience itself right then and there on the rock that is worth noting before we move on? Yeah, well, yes, I would say that as I got up and began to walk away, I knew, I knew that, um, how can I put this? I, I knew that not I had found it, I knew I was it. Mm -hmm. And, and that it, it, was, it wasn't an answer for me, the me that had been seeking, that me had disappeared. <laughs> so it, it was totally different from what I envisioned it would be.
Do you feel right now that there's no me? I'm aware. I'm aware of the me. Yes, I'm aware of this me. And uh, I, and and I had about five years of just pure bliss. Mm. Just every day, night, no no problem. Uh, dreaming stopped. My, my mind had been so active dreaming, and many of them were, uh, you know, painful type dreams or anxiety kind of dreams, panic dreams, and all of that stopped. Sleep became so sweet, mm. and. Uh, er everything, uh, just the very moment in which I was living. I think this is why the young lady introduced me to the power of now, because I was I would share this in in, in our group. I would I'd say just the, just this very moment is just so rich, and there was ah, just it's so peaceful. It's mm. deeper than the aha. I was having some aha moments before this transformation occurred, but afterwards it's like ah, yeah ah. The, not aha, like I am realizing, but I, ah, I am, mm. I am. <laughs> so what happened after five years? Did it? Did you uh, oh, oh, just integrate it more? Oh, you physically fell, right? I took, I took a physical fall in my garage and landed, uh, took a complete flip. Ooh. The light, the light wouldn't turn on. I'm running down the 17 steps or whatever it is. And, and I thought I knew it well enough. I lived here over a dozen years, 15 years, whatever running down the, the stairs and uh, took a miss, missed a step mm -hmm. and did a complete flip and landed on my right shoulder mm. out right on the pavement, the concrete cement pavement, just, ah, uh, just laid there, just, ah, uh, man, it hurt so bad. Pain like I never knew. It'll be one year next month, physical pain, agony. I thought I knew what pain was, but, uh, and there is a difference between pain and suffering because although I had great pain for about six months, I didn't suffer. Mm. Because there was no little story attached to it. There was no me. I mean, I, I was aware of this pain, did not enjoy this pain, but I found that by being present with it, and, but I, after a little while, uh, I did allow murmuring to arise, and it was the reemergence of ego. Ego that I thought was dissolved. Hmm. Here it comes. <laughs> you allowed it because, uh, did you have a choice? It was again. I, I don't know. I, I think I got tired of the of all of the pain and um, so whatever happened back in about j July I finally lost it and became angry with God and, uh, <laughs> uh, yes I did well and then then begins to suffer so yeah. I went from uh, f uh, five years I guess five years to the to the month of, of no suffering no pain and my outward life all through that five years, I want to say, still had many, many challenges and problems, but it didn't seem like a problem. It, it was like, okay, there's that thing I, I need to take care of, but it's like out here. But it, in last July, then I let it back in here. It's not that I, I let it, it's just that it, as I gave into the, whatever it was, I guess it could be like Adam and Eve in the garden partaking of the forbidden, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I had enjoyed, and it was so real. And if I never, if I even reverted all the way back to the old David, which did not happen from this past July for a few months until the miracle healing occurred to my shoulder in October, toward the end of October of 2013, instantaneously a miracle happened, hmm. was instantly healed. Chiropractor was just laughing when he started to work on me. And I didn't, didn't say anything to him. My son went with me, not a word to him. And he started feeling, he said, what? What's going on with you? And so another miracle. There's like four or five major physical miracles. Huh. Yeah. So you're saying that, um, you know, in a way, and correct me if I'm wrong, you kind of regressed a little bit or backslid. Oh, yeah, backslid. To use the old Christian term, I'd say I backslid. Yeah. Uh, murmuring, complaining. Yeah. I, I didn't, you just... Uh, but, you know, people that knew me that were around me were amazed at how, like, I could be in incredible physical pain and not complain. Because and you weren't suffering. I was not suffering. Yeah. Do, you th do you think Christ suffered on the cross? Oh, yes, I do. When he, when he took on it in that agony, then he let the why question in that Adam and Eve let in, to be, to, which led to them partaking of the forbidden fruit. So you think he, he backslid a little bit? Well, he, he experienced the why. He experienced the potential. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mm. So he experienced the why question that in, invariably has led multitudes of us away from God. Hmm. But I don't think he, he did. He, he realigned himself 
nevertheless, what, not what I will. Here and Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Was that, that was on the cross, you said that, not in the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, I believe that he re reiterated what he had prayed in the garden. I see, yeah, I see. Yes, yes. Yeah, because I, I know in the, in the garden he sort of yes, had like... Yes, that's when he lied. And that was the, the, the uh, temptation there in the garden of Gethsemane to not go through and drink the cup that Abba had given him to drink. Yes. Right. Sometimes but, one... But in oh, my case, I did back in, uh, back in last July. I, I truly did. I said, I can't take this anymore. I'd rather be dead. I'm just hurting all the time, day, night. And see, I couldn't sleep. You go months without sleep. Oh, yeah. And, and my mind was just... And so finally, yeah, it broke. But up to that time, it wasn't like I was trying to persevere, endure. There was none of that old, I got to wait this out type of thing. But it was just like, suddenly, yeah, I did. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> Do you believe in the law of karma? I, I think so. I think I was born with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we all are if we, if we, yeah. if we buy into that theory. So, there, yeah. you know, maybe there was some karma. You know, sowing and reaping in a Christian term, yep. but it, same as karma. Same yeah. idea. So maybe there was just some karmic payoff with this shoulder thing, you know? Yeah, it, there may have been. And then uh, may have been producing more karma last July for a while. <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah. there, there's a saying with regard to awakening uh, uh, or impending awakening, which is, uh, you know, when the when the postman knows you're going to move, he tries to deliver all your mail. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So and and people often say that you know they'll have some, sometimes they'll have some awakening and then all hell will break loose afterwards. You know, with just really a lot of stuff, a lot of you know what hitting the fan, um, presumably because they've you know. You, you, well, to quote scripture again, you can't put new wine into old wineskins. And, <laughs> and since there's some new wine flowing in, the wineskin needs upgrading. Yes. Uh, and, you, and, you know, you can look at my, all of my life before that was karma and the playing out of karma, the mm -hmm. wheel of karma. It was both uh, experiencing karmic, uh, uh, ex uh, the experience, you know, the pain, the result of suffering, and then producing more by continuing the, the wrong choices. Yep. Yeah. And I'd say if any of our Christian listeners or other listeners have any trouble with this karma idea, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, the idea that God is omnipresent and yes. e every little particle, exactly. of crea particle of creation is, is um, saturated with intelligence and yes. the, the entire universe is being orchestrated in a way I, that's far beyond the capacity of human intellect. I can think of like a dozen scriptures right now that teach what the Easterners call karma. Yeah, why don't you um, rattle off a few just for fun? Uh, know that God will bring every secret thought into judgment. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Mm -hmm. He that sows to the, to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Mm -hmm. So misery, suffering, is, is, and I can, there's just so many throughout the Psalms everywhere. The, the psalmist experienced it, yes. Mm. So we see it. Uh, I, I suppose that all world religions teach karma in one different vernacular or another. They do. I've seen, I've seen collections of quotes, you know, that are like almost mirror mm -hmm. images yes. from one a religion to the other. Cause and effect. Cause yep. and effect. Mm -hmm. Even in secular society, we see it. So after you had this uh, miraculous healing of your shoulder and the pain went away, which, mm -hmm. you know, skeptics might say was not miraculous, it was just something that was ready to happen or whatever, but wh wh after it happened, uh, did you did you find yourself back in that same sort of blissful presence? That... I, actually, before it, before the before the miracle happened, I was oh, back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, in July, the great misery, the suffering, and I thought, wow, it's been so long, but I do remember this, this kind of intense like dread. Oh, my. I just can't, you know. And then then memories of the past compiling on where there had been none of that for. We're talking half a decade of, of just sweetness, yeah. uh, stillness, an effortless stillness. I, uh, and yes, of course, I was praying and worshiping and uh, meditating, what, whatever you would say, but it was effortless, you know, for those five years. No. Yeah, and then the flip in the, in the garage. Uh, yeah, to drop back. And see, yeah. All this old karma that I, uh, you know, old pain body or old unresolved issues there oh okay so that that was good to, to experience and then to know the way out so it wasn't a 
it, it, it was a, a relapse, but it wasn't down way down here. It was like, you know, here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, if we, if we feel that all is well and wisely put, then it, it wasn't capricious or arbitrary or meaningless or anything else. It, yeah. had, it had its value in, in yes, the, everything. the ongoing story of David mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and his best this interests, little, you know, his, his ultimate, ultimate liberation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now that the pain is gone and uh, you're back to, you know, normal more or less. Yes. Um, is there some kind of deeper dimension or quality to life than there was prior to the accident? No, it's it's like the same sweet nothingness. So it just, <laughs> it's just it just always is, uh, and uh, it's not like nothing to attain to, nothing to strive for, just to enjoy, just mm -hmm. just to be, you know, be in this wonderful state of being. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I have this sort of notion that I always bring up that. Uh, there's continuing evolution. There's continuing. Oh yes. There's continuing I'm, I'm growth. Sure, there is. Yeah, yeah. and it's sure. it's kind of fascinating to consider what. And there's no regret. I want to make it clear. There's no regret for uh, anything that's ever happened in life. Right. Uh, all of the past. There's there's no regret. Everything is as it it was. It happened. It, it it's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every yeah. yeah, everything happens for a reason. Yes. And and, and that's kind of a cliche, but. And we don't mean a reason that human intellect can necessarily define and write out in a paragraph, but in, in the big cosmic scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah, everything happens. Yeah, I, I never feel that I'm communicating what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to. Words, I don't have the vocabulary, the linguistic skill to express. Uh, the, the, when, I, when I teach now, I always just hope they can get it by osmosis. I can't mm. catch the spirit. And, uh, when you, you know, had the original awakening, or yeah. in 2008, uh, you were probably involved in full-time ministry, as you always have been. Um, well, actually, in 2005, uh, when m my wife left me, mm -hmm. yeah, that was such a devastation to me. Never exper expected that. It was just, I took time off from traveling. I see. Yes, voluntarily. I did some. I, I spoke some. Yeah, oh, I guess you would say yes. I, I was in full time ministry. And um, yeah. were you? Did you have to find a sort of a new audience um, after you had this awakening because your usual clientele, so to speak, couldn't relate to it, or did they rise to the challenge and and appreciate the the new perspective you brought? Well, yeah, uh, yes, and yes, uh, yes. There were many that didn't want to hear this, and there were many that did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but it's not not anything I've tried to do, you know. Yeah, because now, I mean, if you know, if you're going to go around saying that all these other religions are valid and that Rumi and Hafiz were cool guys and that yeah. you know uh, Jesus may not be the only way, uh, and, and I don't, I, well, don't I, I kind of put your words in. I put words in your mouth yeah. on that yeah. one. Um, and maybe well, have you heard my? I did. I, did have you heard my CDs? Any of them? I listened to two. I listened to the two CDs you sent me. Okay, I that's, also, that's what I say. I also listened to some stuff on uh, on YouTube that I found. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, if you're gonna, all this stuff is probably a fairly small percentage of, of the Christian world would, would be com right. comfortable with these notions. They're they're really right. out, outside the box. Well, I, well, actually, uh, even before then, years before, I've always been on the quote on the fringe, so to speak. You know, believing in physical healing and actually praying for the sick and seeing healings happen mm -hmm. uh, is kind of fringe Christianity. Kind of. I mean, you, you hear about it all the time, uh, you know, in terms of well, Bi yeah, Bible well, Belt Christianity. Is. Oh no! I mean, yeah. like a lot of your Bible thumping Baptists would have nothing to do with the healing meeting. Okay. Yeah. So really, I was kind of on the, the extreme. Yeah. I guess I'm a little more extreme now. But <laughs> things like that don't bother me. Good. Uh, just uh, like, you know, like Jesus said, every 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 plant my Father has planted, you know, will, will receive and will grow. Mm -hmm. So uh, so yeah, I did sort of put um, words in your mouth when I said this. You know, maybe you don't no. feel like Jesus is the only way. Um, you know. When, when I hear that statement, I again think in terms of the 
pure being or pure spirit or you oh know, yes that's yes. that's the the door through which all yes. must must enter oh yes uh, but Christ. but um but Jesus, the man who lived 2,000 years ago, you know, I have a, a bit of a hard time. You know, I, I think that there probably have been many people, millions, billions throughout the universe who have awakened to their true nature without ever having heard of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I don't know. I would suppose so because uh, Gautama Siddhartha awakened, experienced that tremendous awakening uh, 500 years before mm -hmm. the time of Jesus. So. And uh, we can look at uh, Lao Tzu in, in China. We, we know that he had deep realization. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yet, yet the Christ is eternal. Right. No beginning and no ending. And there are scriptures that actually say uh, that, for example, St. John 1 verse 5, that he was that true light, speaking of the man Jesus, was that true light which lightens every man who comes into the world. Mm -hmm. So the Christ has always been. And the scripture teaches this, although uh, traditional Christians don't understand. It. Yeah. So I feel I've become more scriptural, Rick. I do too. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. More of, the teach, more of the true teaching of what the Bible really teaches, what Jesus Christ actually taught. For example, um, in, in modern day Christianity, uh, there's a teaching of total depravity and that people prior to being born again and professing faith in Jesus are completely dead in sin is, is contradicted by Jesus himself. In the Sermon on the Mount, he looked out at his congregation, so-called congregation, none of them were Christian. They were all in Judaism. And he said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall seek God. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the merciful. He didn't say blessed will be the merciful Blessed will be the pure in heart after you've been born again. <laughs> he said, blessed are. Right. So in other words, his audience, many of them right then were in the kingdom, were pure in heart, mm -hmm. were merciful. Were, were, he, said, he said that you may be shown to be seen as, as Abba's children. So he called them children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. He said, these are the children of God. Mm -hmm. So he saw, he saw it as a present reality during his earthly ministry. And I don't know any Christian group that teaches what he said right there. Yeah. So once again, I'm a heretic for actually teaching what Jesus said. <laughs> I don't mind. Well, fortunately, burning at the stake isn't legal yeah. these days. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that wouldn't be a problem either. Eh, yeah. I don't yeah, know. Wouldn't enjoy might, it. Might be worse yeah. than the shoulder. I don't know, but it'd be over quicker, you know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Who knows? The mind, you know, can speculate. So it's interesting to take some of these quotes that are so often bandied about and uh, you know give the kind of spin to them that you're giving now, uh, you know, yeah. more sort of mystical, I would say, experientially based <coughs> interpretation. Um, you know, for instance, uh, Christ is the only begotten Son of God. What does that mean? Well, actually, uniquely begotten is is what it says in, in the Greek there. Okay. Uh, Uniquely. And then it goes right on, like Peter says, that you also have been begotten again with a, a living hope by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. So we, we're called to begotten. James says he also begot us, that we might be the first fruits of his creatures. So we also have been begotten. So, so we're all uniquely begotten. Yeah, Luke chapter 3 says it gives the genealogy going back to Adam. And if you go re read that, it says, which was the son of so-and-so, which was the son of this guy, and he was the son of that guy. And then it says uh, that uh, e Enos was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Mm. So Adam is called the son of God right there in the New Testament. Okay. So, and I'm sure there are a lot of daughters, too. <laughs> yeah. or, or, or it's just generic. It's just a generic term, yeah. That's... Yeah. Um, and so... How do you uh, interpret this one? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yeah. We've kind of touched on that, but... You know, yeah, I yeah. am. I am. Right. Yes. The amness, yes. Yeah. The, the eternal Christ speaking. In that human form, I am. Once again, I mean, Jesus, no one even knows what he looked like. Uh, what You know, his... Uh, if we came to the physical man, Jesus, it would be impossible. <laughs> but, 
but but he who is speaking out of him right. i am yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, uh didn't also jesus also say something about um you know all these miracles he did all these great things that he did you yes. you you also should do these things and even greater things yes yeah. yes and he said he didn't do them right he, he said he said the, the works that i do john 14 10 i don't do them but abba uh the father aramaic abba Abba, who dwells in me, he he does the miracles. Mm. Yeah, and he and he said this is why he was accused of blasphemy, because he made himself one with God. Mm. He said they said for good work we don't kill you, but because you blaspheme, saying you are the Son of God, you know, because he said I and the Father are one. You know, such statements were such uh, heresy for his day, mm. as what I what I say now is heresy for my day. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, good thing crucifixion isn't legal. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, we've progressed as a society. Yes, we have. have we? <laughs> society has has become more humane. Yeah. Um, isn't that your experience, actually? You know what what you just said about the, the miracles, the the cities that Christ performed. Uh, mm-hmm. Where it wasn't him doing it, it was God doing them. Um, yes, yes. Uh, when you had your transformation, didn't that and isn't that now your experience that you are really not the doer? Uh, it's yes. not you doing stuff. Yes. It's it's some pre- the presence, yes. the divine intelligence, whatever is running the show of this whole universe. Yeah, that's exactly. that's the doer. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's so beautiful. You know, once the uh, ego can be pushed aside at least or to the side. Or like Paul said, I am beside myself, to be beside self. So that the little self can be over here, but, but the real I is over here. And there is the little self over here talking and all, but I am right here. Mm-hmm. That was St. Paul's experience. And in fact, he, he expressed that same realization of transformation all through his writing. And it is no longer I who live, but, but the Christ who lives in me. Yeah. Yeah. I was mm-hmm. I was reading that in your book, and yeah. and incidentally that um, that experience is very well articulated in great detail in in certain you know Vedic and Vedantic literature. Yes, um, yeah. <clears throat> there's this saying in the Upanishads: two birds sit on the self same tree; one eats of the fruit and the other does not, and it goes on very beautifully. But but oh. the the idea being that the um, the pure self, pure being, pure essence, you know, whatever we want to call it. Is you know, and the Gita is full of verses like this too about how, you know, he who, he who takes him to be the actor is is like a thief. He doesn't really he's, he doesn't properly recognize that which acts and that which is non-active, and uh, they, oh. but it goes on and on about how, uh, you know, there is yeah, that that is so beautiful. To, you know, I, I've I have the Gita, mm-hmm. and I've been reading through it, Arjuna. And Krishna and that battle that they were going to undergo, and yeah. I can relate so much to that, and and so many things in scriptures, uh, Christian scriptures relate also to that. Mm-hmm. So so there's so many parallels in, in a lot of these different writings. Uh, the Upanishads I've only read bits of. Uh, I remember something I can recall like, uh, not that which sees, not the eye that sees, but that by which the eye sees. Mm-hmm. That is Brahman. Yes. And not the things that men on earth adore. Yeah, that, that spoke to me. Yeah. There's also a whole section which is very repetitive, but it sort of ticks off all these things. It's not for the sake of the, of the wealth that the wealth is dear, but for the sake of the self that the wealth is dear. It's not for the sake of oh. the wife that the wife is dear, but for the sake of the self that the wife is dear. Wow. And, and so the implication is being that um, all fulfillment ultimately resides in pure being. And all these other kind of relative things, which which we from which we appear to derive fulfillment, are just like little reflections of that. <laughs> it's kind of kind of like the way the the oh, light the light of the moon is really just a reflection of the light of the sun. Yeah, you know, the moon right. isn't generating any light. Exactly, and that's in the Song of Solomon too. The same thought. Oh, what? How does it say it? Uh, let me see. Uh, it, it speaks of the the moon, the glory of the moon reflecting the light of the sun. Mm, beautiful. That that is light does not come from within itself, but it mm-hmm. it reflects. Yeah. Same metaphor. A reflective light. Yes, yeah, same one. Yeah. And uh, you know, also in the Tao Te Ching that I've become acquainted with the last few years, 
uh, I've enjoyed reading it. And so much that you see in the Tao really is very similar to Jesus' teaching on taking the lower seat, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being the valley instead of the mountain. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and like water flows down to the lowest place mm -hmm. there in the Tao. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed what I've read. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So it's, it's cool that, um, you know, you had this profound awakening, yes. transformation, as you put it. And um, as a result of that, it's, it's kind of transformed your whole f philosophical outlook. It's enabled you to recognize, yeah. yeah, it's enabled you to recognize the universality of truth. And yeah, yes, that's been a great discovery the last uh, five or six years now. I've enjoyed I, I I don't I find when I read these these uh, writings they don't really add anything to me but I enjoy it. Yeah. I re I recognize things. Oh yeah. Well that and that's nice. You know, nice to recognize it. I don't need to read the scriptures, uh, but I I enjoy it. Yeah. It doesn't add anything to me to who I sense that I am. Used to it did. See, that's another big difference. So it's like it, it is finished. It. When Jesus said it is finished, uh, it's kind of what it happened to me experientially, July 2008. It is finished. Like it, it's finished and done. Mm -hmm. And even the little uh, regression last year was, uh, although it was a re, a re back into that suffering, was nothing like before. And it was easy to recover from, so to speak. Your cup runneth over. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the cup is full, you know, yeah. it, can't, it can't really hold anymore, but, you know, uh, it can still pour some in. And, yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh -huh. uh. I enjoy your program very much, Rick. I enjoy uh, all the different people you've had on. I, I can resonate with some of them real deeply, wonderfully. Uh, it's good. Yeah. I really enjoy doing it, and I really, it, it helps me a lot talking to all these different people. Uh, I feel like an amoeba, you know, who just sort of, yeah. you know, you ever watch a microscopic movie of an amoeba, how it sort of reaches out and, and yeah, engulfs right. some little yeah, bit okay. of something and then incorporates yeah. it into it. And, and so it's like every week I, when I talk to a new person, I, I read their stuff and watch their videos and all. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a new way of seeing it. I hadn't thought of mm. that. It, it kind of broadens and, and, and diversifies my perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I can see where it does. And, yeah. and me also. I've learned a lot watching i've watched probably 20 or 30 of your interviews at least great yeah so your book is really nice uh, i know you've written a lot of them but i've been reading mm -hmm. this one you can be free, yes. free from yourself and um the yeah, way that's you, the best one yeah <laughs> <laughs> only one other do i recommend now learning to love huh. that's the only one i really think is is good and the way you've written it it's cool i mean we could we could talk for hours just taking each little subhead as mm. as a springboard for uh you know for conversation um but there's some here there's you you place a lot of emphasis on stillness you know yes, be still yes. and know that i am god right, right. and and in one of your recordings i heard you um give a nice interpretation of that with a different translation of the of the original greek or something than you are yes. here you want to tell us that oh uh, yes that would be uh psalm 46 verse 10 uh, okay, now let me see the Amplified. Cease striving, let go, relax, and know I am God. <laughs> and it's the very same verse that is our ordinarily translated as be still and know that I am God, yes, right? Yeah, yes, same one. Cease striving, let go, relax, and know I am. I, actually, the word God is, is not there in the Hebrew. Just know that I am. Yeah, and, and know I am. In other words, you have to let go, cease striving, let go of all of this mental mind stuff before you can know I am. Mm -hmm. Knowing I am. Uh, pure, pure, pure bliss and, and knowing I am. <laughs> and why would you say that is? That um, you know, when the mind is agitated and busy and, and in control, that it prevents knowing the I am? Why, give us your spin on why that is. I think it uh, just, I think it just uh, chatterbox, too much inner noise. You know, this is why people are addicted to outer noise, because when they, when they have outer noise, it, it sort of silences the inner noise. And they turn off noise, they can't stand it, they can't stand quiet. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. There's a lot of that going on in our society today. People have to have outer noise because outer quietness reveals inner noise. Inner noise is the torture, the turmoil, the torment they are always in. And so uh, I think that's why that they have to have such uh, noise all the time. So stillness can lead to quietness, inner quietness, where there's no inner voice, inner dialogue, inner conversation, no past and future. This is why being, being present now is so important because mm. past always adds to noise. Future always adds to noise. The past always says, yeah, if only I hadn't done, if only, and, and future is, what if this could happen, that could happen. And so this is, people live in all the time, this if only with all of its regret and what if with all of its, its few, uh, fear. So you come right to right here, right now. It's nothing, <laughs> no thing. <laughs> mm. Yes, I love it. This kind of sheds light on why solitary confinement is considered such a severe punishment. Yes, it, exactly. You know, you're just shut up by yourself with nothing a but your own with inner... your thoughts. Yep. Yeah, alone with your thoughts and people have gone crazy. Yeah. They've gone stark raving mad in that confinement because, mm -hmm. yeah, there's such an inner voice, inner dialogue. They're attached to those stories of themselves from the past. They're identified with them as roles that they've played. And things have never worked out the way they'd hoped they would. That's the way life is. And so that they have all this regret and then pain as a result of that regret. Many people live with that. People do all the time. If only I hadn't known this, I shouldn't have done that. All the shoulds that people should themselves with. Also, I think that, you know, when there's a lot of external impingement, like ex external stimulation, it kind of keeps a lid on uh, all that we've got bottled up inside. Yes. And, and when we no longer have that, then the Pandora's box lid opens and, and yes. stuff starts to come yes. out. Yes, all and, of that repression yeah. is now coming out. And then it's just an avalanche, uh, a flood of pain, mm -hmm. turmoil. People live with this. Yeah, so so nice to be free from that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> but you kind of have to go through it, don't you? I mean, you kind of uh, have, you have to purge uh, all that stuff. You have to, I did. you have to take, <laughs> take the lid off Pandora's box. And, uh, oh, I, I did. Yeah. You know, 12 and, steps helped and writing out. I had 300 pages of step work written out. <laughs> mm. uh, t typewritten, single space. <laughs> oh, no. So, I, <laughs> oops. So, the, so I guess the uh, cat just peed on the floor. There's a great big, huge puddle here, but <laughs> we'll just continue. Uh, but I, I guess the less, I mean, the teaching here is that you, you know, have to find ways or ought to find ways of, you know, as you say, someone can go stark raving mad if they're in solitary yeah. confinement, but but the, or it's like a, a boiler, if it gets too much pressure, can explode. But you have to find ways of starting to let the steam out and, and reducing yeah. the pressure. So in other words... Well, co coping mechanisms, that's what we learn. And, and all the self-help uh, teachings, you know, people find uh, temporary uh, alleviation or relief. And, and they're good for that. You know, it's, it's helpful to people. Of course, it's not the answer. Not the ultimate answer, but what I'm suggesting right. is that way, ways and means of to starting to unravel that stuff can yes. can be advisable. And that's why I advise, uh, I recommend 12-step groups. Mm -hmm. They have them now for every, every kind of human life problem, not just alcoholism. As, as a lot of people think, oh, I don't have a drinking problem. But, well, no, we have 12 steps for everything now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love 12 steps because it helps you to... Uh, to, to take an honest look. Of course, you know, most steppers, as they're called, they, once a stepper, always a stepper. I, I quit stepping after the transformation after a while. I kept going to meetings for a little while and there was just nothing there. Yeah. And, and it had been so meaningful. And I knew it was a change in me. There was nothing there. And like church services, they, they were just so meaningless to me after that. Huh. Very few of them that I ever enjoyed. Yeah. I haven't been to church in over a year. Wow. Mm -hmm. But you still 
Te- you still preach or get up? And- oh, oh, yeah, when I go out and preach, that's when I go to church. Yeah, as long as you're doing the talking, it's okay, right? <laughs> well, no, it's not like that either. I mean, I mean, it's, I, know. It's, I, I love to go to a church where the, the, but it's just so much acting, you know, play acting, yeah, role acting. Yeah. Well, also a lot of I what sense you see. the spirit sometimes, and, and then soon it's like people become very uncomfortable in church hmm. when, the, when the Holy Spirit's presence is there. And so they immediately quench that. And so I don't enjoy that when the Holy Spirit's presence is quenched or grieved. That's kind of what I was alluding to. Is that you, you, you know, you watch certain things on television. And there's so much whoop de doo and, and oh, you know, uh, yelling and screaming and shouting oh, and emotionalism oh. and and all this stuff. Yeah. And it, it's all noise. And and yeah. so oh, the not only that, so much self, so much look at me. Yeah, I am so wonderful. <laughs> no, no, you aren't. <laughs> and yes, you are. But so is everyone. Mm. So the Quakers the, the, had something. The was no, <laughs> yeah, Quakers. Boy, didn't they have it right. George yeah. Fox, yeah. Lots of silence. That inner light, that inner light that he experienced, that brilliant light. Mm. Once again, yeah, I've recently re-looked at his life, and uh, he, he experienced a transformation. It's really his words, same exact thing. Yeah. I heard you talking in some one of those recordings on the CD about PTSD. You know, yes. uh, which kind of relates to what we're talking about here. I mean, these yes. people come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and yes. there's you know there's kids in inner cities growing up there who have severe PTSD. And more more servicemen are uh, die by suicide these days than in actual exactly yeah in, in so combat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, PTSD any trauma victim can have PTSD. Mm-hmm. Know? It's true, yeah, and it's a very real trauma, very real trauma, and there, I feel much compassion. Uh, for people suffering from PTSD. Yeah, and it's something that um, you can't just take a week in Aruba, you know, to get rid of, no, because no. it has accumulated level uh, after level again, after level. That program can be very helpful mm. uh, to people with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or, or any kind of depression, people suffering from depression. Uh, and it, it doesn't even have to be geared to your particular thing, just... I, I, when I was going to step meetings, uh, I would go to all kinds of, of step meetings, yeah. Hmm. Overeaters and divorce recovery and everything else. Went to some AA meetings. I, I loved them all. I always, it didn't matter what the uh, Al Anon, doesn't matter. I, I went to all of these different ones, whatever, and I always was helped, yes. Mm-hmm. Scott Killaby is, I don't know if you've, you're aware I've of him. heard of him. Yeah, he, he's doing something now with people who have been substance abusers, using sort of non-dual teachings to help them overcome that. I don't know whether oh. it's a twelve-step thing or what. And uh, I also interviewed a guy named Tom Catton, who was a serious drug abuser, um, who uses a sort of a spiritual twelve-step. I believe I watched his interview. Yeah, a guy out in so, Hawaii. Yes, I did. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, I brought up the PTSD thing just because. Um, and, and even 12-step, I mean, I'm sure it's very profound and valuable, but it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's an active thing. There's a lot of talking and, yes. and so on. And I'm kind of interested in what you did and what seemed to lead up to your transformation, which was a deep silence in the early hours yes. of the morning. You know, I, I think and, that... Well, a, lot of, a lot of prayer, Christian-type yeah. praying, yes. Mm-hmm. And then go, going into silence. And it would just naturally happen, yes. And not just during the deep morning, but 10, 12 hours a day. So, but, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I think that there's an efficacy to that that oh, y- yeah. you might not get from more active forms. Oh, of, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, it, it, they all have their place. Everything has its place. There's no one thing fits all. Yeah. Right. Just whatever you find help in doing, do it until you don't need to do it anymore. Well put. <laughs> So let's see. Be still and know. We've talked. I just have to go through a few things in your book. We've talked a little bit about observing the mind from outside the mind. This mm-hmm. this uh, kind of state yes. state that develops in which, you know, there's the surface level of your life with your mind yes. and your all, all yes. that you're doing. But there's some. And in fact, you used a nice example, which I often use, of running through an airport uh, and trying. Yeah. You know, where you here you are in this hectic situation, huffing and puffing, running through the airport. Yes. And yes. yet there's this, you know, nothing's happening. There's this deep silence. Yes, and, I love it. And then you get to your gate and you realize you missed your connection. And, and, and <laughs> yeah. instead of freaking. Ah, yeah. It's <laughs> fine. Everything yeah. is fine. Okay, what next? You know, what, this, this, there must be something in this. 
Um, early on in the interview, we were talking about the difference between, I think it was uh, spirit and soul, was it? Or, or Yes, we were. I'm interested in some of the, what you might have to say about some of the distinctions between these sort of subtle uh, words like spirit, soul, and then God. Um, are there gradations, or are we, or is it all the same stuff down there, and we're just using different different <laughs> words to uh, <coughs> identify it? Well, and I know that even in Orthodox Christianity, there's a lot of difference on what is the spirit from what is the soul, and what I've seen in Hinduism uh, that the soul, the soul is the same thing, like what we call spirit in mm -hmm. Christianity, the innermost self, the inmost being. In Judaism, the soul, like like in classical Judaism, there's only two: soul and body. Hmm. Whereas in Christianity, there's spirit, soul, and body. But the spirit is housed within the soul. And what we say, uh, but but you know, this isn't all, all that helpful to know. It, it, it can be helpful, I guess. You know, spirit would be the life, the deep life part of you, one with God, the life. Mm -hmm. Or the light part of you, one with the light. Or the am part of you, one with the I am. Mm. See, soul would be the you part of you. Your mind, your will, your emotions, your personality, your likes or dislikes, uh, your propensities uh, toward this or that. That's all part of soul. Mm. Memories, feelings, that's, all that is soul. Kind of sounds like in the Indian perspective, they have Jiva, Atman, and Brahman, you know, and they're... I'm not well familiar with those. I have heard of it. But sort of like I, Russian dolls. I mean, the Jiva is the, the kernel of individuality, which in Indian perspective transmigrates from life to life and which carries with it a whole, okay. whole packet of everything that makes you an individual person. Oh, you know, okay. and Atman is, is more of the pure spirit, but still, in, as I understand it, um, kind of an individual reflection of of the deeper thing which is brahman which is the totality just okay. you know, hold okay. the wholeness of reality i guess it, yeah that's good there yeah. you again there's another parallel <laughs> uh, here's a subtitle in your book entitled stillness becomes as natural as breathing mm -hmm. and i think that's an important one because um it might sound to some people like this is something you have to keep practicing in order to live it. You know, you have to sort of be on your toes and make sure you're not getting, uh, you know, losing the stillness and so on. But what, you, what you're saying is that it, it just uh, becomes second nature. It's not something you have to do anything to live. Right. I'm in deep stillness now. Right. Like a deep inner hum. Mm -hmm. It's just there. And you would be if you were riding a motorcycle or watching a movie or driving the car, driving the car, shopping yep. in the store. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the mind, the mind, when it takes its focus upon something, it can do so while the deep resonation uh, is going on deep in here. Mm -hmm. and, and then there is uh, awareness of deeper and deeper. And sometimes it's very, very deep, very deep. And then other times more a little bit like uh, right off here in the distance, but it's still there like uh, a gentle flowing brook that I'm hearing, although, although I'm not hearing a gentle flowing brook. <laughs> but it's like, it would be like that, hearing a, a brook flowing outside my window. Yeah, the brook is a good example. Sometimes I've used yes. the example of a tone, like let's say there's a tone playing. And, uh, you know, if you want to, you can listen exclusively to the tone and just, okay, tone, hey. there it is. But uh, other times... See, that's why I learned, I learned so much watching your program. <laughs> but other times, you know, you might be talking to people or yeah. doing, doing something else, and yes. the tone is still there. Yes. You know, yes. and if you want exactly. yeah, yeah. to pay attention to it, you can, but it's there whether or not you do. Good. Yeah. That's very good. <laughs> Um, You've had more years uh, than I have had in, in experiencing this and have learned how to describe it. Yeah, but that's not to say that my experience is deeper or clearer than yours by any means. Right, you right. know, years don't really matter. Yeah, yeah our time is irrelevant. Is yeah, it? yeah. I, I started from a pretty muddled condition. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember watching that on one of your interviews. I think drugs and... Yeah, all, and, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's, that was okay. That's what, yeah. I, that's what I had to go through. Sure. Um, so... 
again about this sort of stillness that you don't have to do anything to maintain. Um, you've heard me ask this one too. Uh, a lot of people, for instance, our friend Francis, um, report that when they sleep, um, it's it, it's not lost. It maintains. Yeah, that's right. it's, yes. it's sort of a, and so. And it, when it, when you wake up, it's uh, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. and it's like it's been just, there all it's along. Just, it's just me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that is that your experience also? And let's say, have you yeah. ha, have you yes, had any kind some, of? Uh, uh, back in this past July, when when that when the pain the thing, thing I first noticed after I had endured all those months in physical pain, I still had that deep stillness all through that time, and then uh, in that July for that period of time that went back into suffering, one of the first things I noticed that when I did awaken, it was like tor torturous and tormenting. Of course, there was no deep sleep anyway, as long as that physical pain was in my body. Mm. I, w I went nine months without a, a night's rest. Only an hour here, two hours there. Because wow. once I'd get into a deep sleep, I'd, I'd move, and the shoulder and the collarbone was all jammed up. <laughs> it was, uh, it would waken me. So it was constantly living in that kind of agony. Yeah. But, but yes, after the healing in October, uh, of 2013, instantly I was able to lift my shoulder. Uh, a man on the phone uh, called me on the phone who has a healing gift in, in Christian circles. And I called him, he'd been praying for me instantly. I mean, instantly my arm went straight up. Uh, did things I couldn't have done. And, you know, the next day went to the chiropractor. He was just so amazed. Uh, and he could tell instantly uh, with my expression, my visage. Healing is real. Miracles are real. Mm. That's one thing I have to be so thankful for is all the physical miracles I've seen. Yeah. But with that, when with the restoration and the ability to sleep physically again, there was a, again that really deep presence. Yes. Yeah. I sometimes wonder about, um, you know, all right, I, I coddle myself. You know, I get plenty of rest and I meditate and I eat well and I take care of myself. And so there's this nice sort of presence and smooth kind of continuum of awareness and all. I wonder though, you know, if I were subjected to some serious injury or pain or deprivation yeah. or captured by the Russians and injected with weird drugs or you know, something like yeah. that, uh, yeah. what... Uh, how stable it would be, you know. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, you're you're suggesting that Christ Himself lost it on on the cross, uh, yeah. and He was obviously much more profoundly established. Yes, yes, than, yes. than just about anybody. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And anyway, I don't know if you can answer that, but it's just a curiosity. Well, I I know that uh, for several months there there was no no difference in, in the interstate. There I was aware of the physical, but it was like it was happening, like over here beside me again. Like happening was, to somebody else almost. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Although I knew it wasn't. Yeah. Once again, I find that I feel like I'm lying or, or failing to describe uh, constantly now because uh, I just don't have the words to describe what, what's going on. So I haven't had a chance to finish your whole book. Um, just read the first couple of chapters and, uh, you know, what is stillness, the joy of being deeply joined. But then you have so. Let me just quickly read the other titles and see if there's anything you want to um, bounce off of, you know, what is the source of inner and outer conflict? Uh, stop me if you want to comment on any of these. What are you? The process and crisis of metamorphosis. Um, the cruel torment of the carnal mind. The body-soul oh, yeah, body connection. <laughs> you, know, you want to talk about that one for a bit? Yeah, the, cr the cruel torment of the carnal mind. Yeah. Paul said that the carnal mind is not subject to God. The carnal mind is an enemy of God. And uh, the carnal mind means the mind set on flesh, carne from the Latin flesh, flesh feasting mind. So this outward realm, this 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 part here in the world, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so that it produces torment. It's a torturer. You think people live with such torture and torment that they do to themselves through their mind. That if they were married to that mind, they would divorce him. <laughs> they yeah. wouldn't put up living with someone that said, oh, you're terrible. You just never do anything right. Oh, you're such a goofus. <laughs> Why can't you do this? The things their mind that they allow going on in their mind, doing them day and night, they would never live with another uh, wife or husband that, that did that to them. Mm -hmm. But yet they're content to live with it. So, yeah. So how do you stop it? 
Well, the, uh, the, the that that was it. The stillness. Stillness. You know, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's kind of move toward a conclusion uh, by dwelling on that bit for a, for a moment. I mean, for people listening to this interview and. A lot of people who are listening to this interview have already some kind of spiritual practice or something yeah. they do. But there's a lot of people who are just really shopping around and, and they listen to a lot of different things in, in the hopes of finding something that's going to work for them. Yeah. You know? So um, do you have any actual prescription, so to speak, for, for somebody who's looking at, for a means of, of getting established in stillness, you know, like like the experience you had, or just progressing on the spiritual path. Hmm. Practical, something people can take yeah. away that, you know. Okay, practical. Yeah, I would say observe your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, be, become the aware. Vipassana kind of thing? Well, okay, become aware mm -hmm. when you're being mind ruled. Mm -hmm. That would be a good practice, good place to start. Become aware when your mind is if only or what ifing you. Beware when you're getting caught up in some role or, or function and think that's who you are because that is not who you are. I think that would be good, just a good practical advice to give someone, anyone. Mm. Yeah, I kind of think of a movie when you say that, like you're watching a movie and it's getting really scary and you, you know, you can remind yourself, hey, it's only a movie. You know, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this monster isn't really coming after me. Yes. Uh, so you can you can actually loosen up the grip of identification by just some a little bit of reflection of like, wait a minute. After all, you know, this is only my mind. This is only a thought. This yeah. is a, this is only an opinion. This is only an an attitude, and and so on. It's not the ultimate reality. Yeah, I think that'd be good. Uh, and look for moments of stillness. Everyone has them. Mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly, you know, they can be busy all day and, and suddenly they're aware that they're not racing inside. Well, become aware of that. Uh, uh, notice that. Enjoy it. You know, reading as much as your book as I have and listening to your talk, you actually it's actually had an influence on my meditation practice. Um, oh, wonderful. It has. I've... Uh, there's been a kind of a shift in a very, very subtle shift in emphasis to recognizing the stillness that's already there. Yes. Uh, as, a, as opposed yes. to be focusing on the object of meditation. There, there's okay. just sort of, because it, it is already there. And just there's kind of been a little bit of a shift in the balance in terms of just dwelling in that silence that's already there. It's been, yes. I, I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Rick. And yeah. I've enjoyed uh, your programs very much. Yeah learned profited much from you one other thing before we go in terms of prescription um, would you prescribe or recommend that people you know get into some kind like you you did several hours of prayer a day sometimes 12 hours of prayer a day and you know you must have had your own way of praying but is there something kind of a generic way that you can recommend as a practice oh, yes. that people can just do for a certain period of time even 20 minutes um, oh sure well, yeah I, I think it'd be great if everyone prayed yeah it, it, just to talk to God uh, you know the, the other that you sense that you are looking for go ahead speak talk sit reflect however you desire but if you are that presence I know, but you may not sense it. You know, most people don't know that what they are. So for a start, yeah. you can sort of intentionally set up a dualistic situation in which you're, exactly. you're talking to something that's <clears throat> other than yourself. You, you know, it wasn't like until a year or two ago that I even understood or comprehended mentally dual versus non-dual. Mm -hmm. And that was because of, of reading other writings. I finally, oh, now I see what they're saying. Then I saw something that Jesus said once. He said, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. But, but what the English translation is, there's none good but the one God. But you go into the Aramaic, there is none good but the one, in caps, the one. Mm. But so he, he was really what we would call non-dual. <laughs> I think we could shorten that to say there is none but the one. <laughs> yeah, none but the one. It's what he said. Yeah, because if it's really one, and if, if, mm. if God is really omnipresent, That's then right. show me where he doesn't, you know, show me anything. Exactly show right. me anything that's not that. <clears throat> but in other words, those were new terms that right. that helped me say, "Oh yeah, now that that helps me understand a little bit." Yeah. Didn't add anything to me, 
or to my enjoyment, but uh, my sense of being. But but yeah, it was a oh, okay, it's a better way to describe it, to term mm -hmm. it, to understand. Yeah. But but people that are watching this, maybe some of them have never had this realization or awareness or suddenly. And so yeah, to pray, cry out to God as you understand it. Why mm -hmm. not? Yeah. I think, you know, there's no end to under... There's so to, many paths. Yeah, there's you know, so many paths. You could, you, could, you could read scripture. You could practice meditate. You could, you could pray in tongues. You know, praying in tongues is something I've mm -hmm. practiced for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Wonderful divine enablement, mm -hmm. yeah. which, which most Christians completely dismiss huh. as relegated to the first century of the church. Yeah. I've seen that happen in yogic circles too, where people are. I've heard uh, about that. Yeah, there's like an enlivenment of Kundalini, and all kinds of stuff starts coming out of your mouth. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. I've been through it myself. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So many paths. Um, great. All right. Well, this has been a, a stimulating conversation. Um, well, thank you, Rick. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. You know, I always after interviews, I always have this sort of postpartum depression in a way where I feel like, oh, golly, I should, should have asked that, or I didn't go deep enough there, or I talked too much there, or, you know, I didn't kind of grasp the subtlety of the person adequately and, and all that stuff. So um, they're actually, in the Vedic literature, there's usually, they start with this whole apology in the beginning where, you know, the, the writer says, I'm completely incapable of doing this, you know, so par okay. par pardon all my shortcomings, <laughs> but, but here goes, you know. Once again, you described the way I felt. <laughs> yeah. I feel, once, uh, I feel so inadequate, you know, to, to describe what has happened. Yeah, well, I always feel that way myself, and I feel that, I, I feel inadequate as an interviewer. I, I always sort of have this feeling like, you know, if I were, I mean, it seems silly, but I'm just being honest. If I were, if I were only more deep and clear and wise and so on, then then I could really probe and do do justice to the person and and so on. But anyway. Well, but when this is over, I, there, it, there won't be anything like that in me. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's just so sweet. I just sense the sweetness. Yeah. I no. sense it. Oh, so wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> it's just just my neurosis. <laughs> oh well, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks, David. Um, okay. Thank you. Don't hang thank up. I'm going to make some concluding remarks here. Okay. So uh, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. And um, I, you know, here this is Buddha at the gas pump, and I've only had a few Buddhists on, and I've only had a couple of Christians on. So I really need to add to my you know <laughs> collection of <laughs> Buddhists and Christians, and get a few Muslims in there too. In fact, somebody emailed me the other day and said, "Have you had any Muslims?" I couldn't think of any except maybe Llewellyn. Llewellyn, you're right, because he's a Sufi. That's what I told yeah. the guy. Uh, so we'll broaden it out. Um, but in any case, I've been speaking with David Alsobrook, and as always, I will be linking to his website from mine, from his page on, on Buddha at the Gas Pump, which is batgap.com. And uh, there you will also see a number of things. Um, you'll see uh, a link to an audio podcast that you can subscribe to on iTunes. You'll see a link to a forum section specifically about this interview. And... Uh, it's really like herding cats, keeping people on topic in that forum section, but I would really appreciate it if people can try to stay on topic, and if they feel like going off top topic and talking about something entirely different, there's a place in the forum for that, so take it there. Uh, there's a place to sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted. You'll see that there. There's a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking if they feel the inspiration to do so. And... I don't know, there's probably a few other things if you explore the menus, but that's about it. So thanks for listening or wa and watching, or watching. And uh, I've reshuffled the schedule a little bit, but next week is going to be Elizabeth Sartoris, who is an evolutionary biologist and futurist. And I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation. One more morsel for the amoeba. <laughs> so I'll see you next week. <laughs>